Hi, Dr. Patrick Gentempo here, and thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We have great content in store for you. I'm so excited to be here with you, and let's jump right into it. Jeff, excited to have this conversation. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's uh, get into your background a bit as far as how you got to be doing what you're doing today. What led you here? Yeah, it's a long story. I'll try to condense it. Um, but I started as a technologist working for big companies like Cisco and Salesforce, uh, moved on to a startup that does automation, uh, worked for a couple of crypto companies as well called Tonkin. Uh, we actually raised $50 million last week. Um, Congratulations. Then, thank you. Uh, and then cryptocurrency has been more of like a kind of hobby, started as like an investment group talking about which uh, cryptocurrencies to buy, uh, started with Bitcoin and Ethereum, then realized Ethereum was making huge waves. Um, the first real life use case was like fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 2017, we, we got really tactical. Uh, we formed a group, we labeled ourselves Rocket Fuel. Uh, and then soon we started becoming quite famous in the, in the whole industry. We had our logos on different events and different projects. Uh, and then I started writing a newsletter, uh, just kind of making sure to have all my research go to waste. And uh, I'm still writing the newsletter. Uh, people still want to hear what I say, uh, but really I'm just a, a random guy that just likes crypto. <laughs> so since you're a technologist and you, you probably have the deeper uh, understandings about uh, you know, crypto and, and maybe the mechanisms, how it works, maybe give us like uh, the layperson's translation. What is cryptocurrency? Why should we be interested in it? And um, and what do you think the future is going to be? So kind of go in that order. Yeah, in, in terms of the technology, it's really a shared source of record. And up until this point, there was really no such thing as a server that nobody owned or a, a database that nobody could control. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what Bitcoin was. It was this large table or Excel sheet that has uh, people, you know, you, you can use keys that can receive money or receive records, and only you can send it out of that that record. So what's what happens is a bunch of people are controlling all these servers, and people can interact with these servers that get printed across the whole network. So that that's a little bit more technical, mm -hmm. but to summarize, it's really a shared database that nobody really controls, and then the people that are supporting it are all getting rewarded for it. That's what we call mining. So are different coins have different functionality like okay so that does mining there's no real utility outside of that except that it's sort of like you know people agree that it has some value and that's you know it creates demand for it and they limit supply through the mining process i guess um are there other types like is ethereum kind of based on a different premise or you know, for example yeah so bitcoin you could think of it as only the excel sheet layer it's only a ledger of who has what and it gives the ability of people to send the funds. And really the value is just determined by who thinks it has value, right? It's a buyer and seller's market and uh, crypto is extremely speculative. So there's not as many fundamentals as a company or a right. startup, right? Now with Ethereum, they added a programmable layer, a logic layer on top. And the logic layer actually is completely Turing complete, meaning you could write a full on computer application if you wanted to, but it's actually not very robust in terms of scale. Like I can't write a whole like I can't write Facebook on top of Ethereum without running into some problems with slow transfers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is people thought about it. They said, okay, now I could write code on top of a blockchain. And the first use case that really caught on fire was creating other coins. So on top of Ethereum, you know, you have your main protocol layer. That's the, the fee, Like you need Ethereum to make transactions. But then people started creating other coins on top. And then these coins represented other startups. And pretty soon all of these other mini startups started popping out of nowhere saying, hey, buy our coins. Uh, in the future, we'll offer some sort of great service, uh, whether it's uh, music, whether it's like NFTs, whether it's uh, like ticketing or real estate, doesn't matter. In the future, we promise it's gonna be some crazy awesome service. So what happens was like a gold rush. Everybody was like, oh, I can just grab all these coins. And then the moment they get listed onto an exchange, it, it pops up, right? So it became like a game. Uh, sort of like a VC game where you mm -hmm. invest in a bunch of assets and hope one pops. But this was way more early stage, way more speculative, and things were just out of control uh, multiple times in the last couple of years. Yeah, and that's what I was just about to say. So it's, it's sort of like uh, these people are saying, uh, we hold some promise for a future that we're building on top of Ethereum. 
and therefore, uh, yeah, so it's like, it is, it's like a venture kind of play, or maybe even an angel play. It's a very early stage, as you said, highly speculative if they'll ever actually get that, whatever it is to work. So in, from the investor standpoint, uh, I'd be looking and tell me if, if I'm right or wrong here, but I'd say, well, they all seem to be wanting to build on top of Ethereum. So Ethereum seems like it's got something that might have some you know, substantive value with these other people coming on. Does Ethereum benefit when other people are building on top of their, uh, you know, their platform on their layer? Yeah, everything that happens on the pricing of Ethereum is completely based off demand and supply. Um, and what happens is if I need to send a transaction, I need Ethereum, right? And if I need to create a coin, I need Ethereum to deploy the contract. So what happens is people start hoarding Ethereum. They start buying it up off the market. And that's where we saw the first spike to $1,000 back in 2017. And that, that just causes like a supply crunch, right? Because people need that to actually create stuff and write code and do stuff on Ethereum. Um, and a lot of speculators came in too, right? People are like, well, Ethereum looks like it's doing well. I don't know why, but I better get in. And then you see these like giant uh, demand influxes as well that cause these price fluctuations. But so if I, but if I'm the person who's using Ethereum, you know, to build my own coin, you know, that's going to be maybe doing something in music or any other things that you listed, am I paying Ethereum for that? So there's not actually an Ethereum company, right? There are developers that have Ethereum, mm -hmm. but what happens is it's completely decentralized. There is a network that you can deploy code to, and people are free to use that code. They could even copy the code, and in fact, it happens all the time. And then what happens is you have a, you can have a website where the record is stored on Ethereum, but when you see the interface, you're you're using your wallet to interact with it. Whether that's trading coins, whether that's executing commands on the contract, these it's, it's like you're playing with a, a shared world computer that everybody uh, treats as a source of truth. And then what happens now though is that it gets a little too clogged up. There's too many users on Ethereum, and the price of Ethereum transactions go up too. So uh, at the peak of this whole bull run, it costs $300 to make a, a trade. So just want $300 to make a trade is like kind of a big barrier to like new newcomers, right? Um, so what happened later is new networks popped up, same technology as Ethereum, but you could kind of migrate the coins to that next chain and then trade over there for cheap and then migrate the coins back on Ethereum. So we'll get to this probably later, but what formed was like a network of blockchains. So there's like the expensive Ethereum and then there's all these networks and others, other apps that are cheaper to use. Wow, so and you know, the thing I think that's really hard to, to wrap one's head around is how do you try to assert or assess value here? It's because you know, I've come in and, and I, you know, just for disclosure, I own Bitcoin, I own Ethereum, and I own a couple other you know, uh, coins. I have, a, I think, a, a general understanding kind of of it, but not, uh, but I, I'm still kind of always saying, but okay, but where's the value actually happen? At what point does it say Ethereum is something that is here to stay, that has value that, uh, you know, because as you're saying, you know, it's out there, it's free, people can use it. Uh, there's now some, there's like some downside to it all. At, w at what point do, uh, do I finally like say, okay, but there, it all traces back to something <laughs> that says there's, there's a value here that, that is sustainable. Um, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, so this is a great question. This is like the billion dollar question. And right now it's all speculation. Mm -hmm. And the if you look at like the charts, like 2017, mm -hmm. people saw Ethereum as a vehicle for fundraising. That actually yeah. became value, right? I could put in, I could buy Ethereum, send it to across any other channel. It could be, it literally takes seconds to send Ethereum, like millions of dollars even, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the people on the other side can convert that to fiat or the local currency. So that was like 2017's bull run. But then people kind of figured out all these services that are coming out have no value, right? right. Or at least they don't, they haven't proved value yet. There's no product market fit. And now 2018, 2019, you look at the price, it just keeps going down. And that's exactly the reason why there's no end goal or end state for Ethereum, right? But then in 2020, there was a use case. And what happened was a concept called automated market making, which means that I can deposit a coin that I generate on Ethereum into a pool. And then if I make another pool, I can trade across them. Mm -hmm. So what happened was everyone had this idea, oh, I, want, I want to make an, a crypto exchange without any uh, login. I, I want to make a crypto exchange without any emails or uh, centralized governance. These liquidity pools became that. And that's, and that's that took three years to happen, right? 
So what happened in 2020 was billions of dollars of volume was being traded on Ethereum. Uh, and at some point, the exchange volumes of Ethereum, like on Ethereum, the transactions itself, surpassed that of centralized exchanges. Um, right now, it's about, it's still centralized exchanges are winning now. But if you think about it, that was a service that was a billion dollar industry, like multi, multi, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit those exchanges were making, mm -hmm. now got transferred to a completely decentralized network, a shared computer, mm -hmm. right? So that was 2020, the reason why things started coming back. And then of course, 2021, there's all these other reasons we can talk about later. But the point is, there needs to be some progress in the product market fit. Users have to want to use Ethereum or other crypto networks. Otherwise, what's the point of them, right? I can just mint a coin, I can sell it on an exchange, and then nothing happens. So that's the problem with 99% of the projects out there. But as you can see, like with the automated market making, there was definitely users that wanted to use it. They wanted to buy Ethereum, they wanted to buy those tokens, they came onto the network and started trading, right? So that's what I would say is the value, is that there's progression in the technology, progression in use cases, and product market fit. Thanks so much for being here and watching that video. And can I ask you to please subscribe to our channel so you can find out when we're posting new content. You'll be alerted right away when we do. To share this with people you think might benefit from the information, and certainly it helps us if you like the video. So if you like what you just saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And again, thank you so much for being here with me right now.